Uh, this is a report, an interim report on a larger three-year project funded by the National Science Foundation in the U.S. to develop open and reproducible tools for analyzing socioeconomic neighborhoods. Uh, they're used heavily in the social sciences, that is, neighborhoods are, uh, and we're trying to address what we think is a pretty critical gap, and evidently NSF does as well. Uh, this is collaborative work with myself, Eli Knapp, and um, Wei Kong and Su Han, who are at the Center for Ge Geospatial Sciences, which is a new center at the University of California, Riverside, that started last July, right after SciPy. And then Eli Wolf is actually on the team. He's from over the pond, University of Bristol, um, School of Geographical Sciences. So I'm going to talk about the motivation for the broader project, uh, why this matters or why we think it matters, and then turn it over to Eli who's going to give you some insights as to the tool that we're developing, one particular tool. There's a research component in terms of developing new analytical methods, but at the end of the day there will also be a research infrastructure that will be available to the community. So neighborhoods matter. We don't have to convince our colleagues in the social sciences, be they urban economists, uh, economic geographers, sociologists, political scientists, there's a very large literature to suggest that where you live matters quite a bit to all kinds of human behavior. For example, people have heard of the movement to opportunity studies in, in Chicago, right, 1994 to 98, there was this experiment where families in poor neighborhoods were given the option, randomly selected, and offered a voucher to move out of poor neighborhoods into better off neighborhoods, and this is sort of a perfectly controlled experiment in the sense that you would compare the outcomes of the families that took advantage of the voucher to the families that stayed behind in terms of earning potential for their households, kids, outcomes in schools, and a host of other socioeconomic indicators. And the evidence from the study says that it didn't matter. But there's been some more recent work that said, well, that although it appears that that was uh, a random lottery when in fact the people who were selected to be issued a lottery or the option of a lottery were indeed selected randomly. The families that took advantage of the offered lotteries were not random. They tended to be the families that had uh, invested a lot of time in protecting their children from the environments they were currently in. So a follow-up study looked at the folks that were forced out of public housing when their buildings were demolished and then compared those folks in this sort of enforced lottery to the folks who were left behind in undemolished buildings. And the, the differentials in the outcomes were significantly larger. So neighborhoods matter. Uh, there's been some recent work that's attacked, uh, attracted quite a bit of uh, attention on the impact of neighborhoods on uh, intergenerational income mobility. Do you earn more than your parents do? And this tracks uh, the same level of poverty for households where you live impacts your future mobility. So families at the same level of income strata do not experience the same type of mobility in the income distribution in space. It matters. And Austin evidently is a pretty good place. On average, those poor families over a course of a lifetime earn $1,600 more. The kids do over the course of a lifetime just from growing up in Austin. Now, we've been here for a couple days in Austin, and this is at the county level. If you walk around Austin, you, you realize there's quite a bit of socioeconomic heterogeneity below the county level. Austin is in Travis County. In Travis County. Thank you very much. <laughs> That's my mistake. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So there is a rich literature in, on using neighborhoods for social sciences, but there's really two branches of this literature. There's so-called neighborhood effects literature, which we're, we just gave you two examples of, where neighborhoods are looked at at containers. And those containers are fixed, and social scientists study outcomes of folks in one container versus folks in a different group of containers, right? There's a separate literature called neighborhood dynamics, where you're actually looking at the neighborhood itself as an object of studying in terms of those dynamics over time rather than cross-sectional comparisons, but also in the spatial structure. Neighborhoods evolve not just in the socioeconomic composition who lives there, but through processes like gentrification, annexation, and so on, the boundaries actually change. Right? So there's spatial dynamism there that needs to be in account. And our, our goal in this project is to bring these two literatures together. Okay, these are just some sort of canonical studies in the effects literature, so looking at uh, what's the relationship between uh, social disorganization and crime in a neighborhood, uh, social efficacy, income mobility I already talked about, but you can look at the relationships between the built environment and child childhood obesity or, or, or array of or health outcomes and educational outcomes. So there's a massive number of studies that have taken neighborhoods as the unit to organize the studies. Okay. 
This just gives you some flavor for the dynamics literature, that second branch of the literature I talked about. So uh, here you can either think about how, say, segregation has changed over time in a given North American city, or how the housing market might have inverted in a city. There's this so-called great inversion, where there's supposed to be a swapping, if you will, of lower income groups moving out to the suburbs and the center cities being rediscovered by the gentrifiers. Okay, so that's, those are spatially dynamic processes. Underlying this is the ability to define neighborhoods, and there's a lot of interesting work being done in what's known as geodemographics, that is basically defining places based on the characteristics of the, the people who live in those places. From a social science perspective, this is very important because it helps us come up with operational notions of, of neighborhoods, but it also has clearly uh, ap applications in industry. Geodemographic is a massive industry, very profitable. Uh, and Companies use this to do market segmentation. So this is an example of Esri's product, Tapestry, where they come up with 16 typologies, of, or a typology of 16 different types of neighborhood clusters, things like uh, laptop and latte. So these are based on multivariate clustering. And then the challenge is to come up with these trendy names. But then this gets sold to companies that are interested in doing location-based analysis for market targeting and things of this nature. So it has applications in both social science, but also in um, location services and businesses. So our goal is to integrate these two literatures, effects literature and the dynamics literature. And now this is challenging, and there's two sets of challenges. First, what defines a neighborhood? Okay, that's an open question. Neighborhoods, after all, are constructs. My neighborhood might be different from, my childhood neighborhood is very different from what my brothers would think is their neighborhood, because we each have different activity spaces, okay? So at the individual level, you could have an egohood where you're defining your boundaries. So it gets into interesting literature. But if we want to do this from a macro perspective, there are objective ways to do this, but there's no consensus about how to do that. So we define neighborhoods in terms of spatial extent, or in terms of population contained, or socioeconomic homogeneity or, 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 and there's a pretty large and evolving literature on this. What's been really ignored, however, is the dynamics of the neighborhoods. Again, the effects literature, neighborhoods are taken as containers and fixed over time. So we study whether neighborhoods become more gentrified over time, but its boundaries never change, when in fact the boundaries may, may in fact change. So we need to think of more comprehensive ways to study cities and these questions. So our project's goal for the NSF project is fourfold. First, we want to produce new approaches towards spatially explicit definitions of neighborhoods that also build in the dynamics. And we'll see a little bit of examples of how we plan to do that or how we have done some of that already. That's part one. Part two is to come up with new measures that we can then bring to bear on the neighborhoods once they're defined to have richer depictions of spatial dynamics in an urban setting. And then there's thorny data issues involved here. Um, the US Census data, we're doing this for the whole country, for all the cities in the US. Uh, since census is our primary data source, every 10 years there's a new census, the boundaries can change. So what used to be a tract that held 4,000 people, that same extent suddenly might hold 8,000 people 10 years on, and the census will split that tract. So your boundaries are no longer constant. You need to deal with harmonization issues. And then finally, in this literature, most of this research is not reproducible. Uh, there have been efforts to build consistent boundaries, but you cannot reproduce them. You have to just use what these other researchers have done. So the fragility of our inferences about segregation dynamics, about income inequality, it's an unknown how robust those findings are, even though they drive policy in a lot of cases. And we want to address that. Fortunately, we're engaged in the Python ecosystem and we think it's a wonderful opportunity to bring to bear a lot of the tools that we've been learning about here at SciPy to pressing social science research problems. So we're leveraging PySAL, which is a library many people on the team work on. GeoPandas, we're gonna leverage heavily, or we are leveraging heavily, and then the richness of Scikit, Scikit-Learn, stats models, and then the never-ending influx visualization front ends um, that's going to be year three because we don't know which one to, to rest on. But we do have some stuff we want to share with you. And the goal in, in this talk is to advertise and get other people interested in joining the team because it's a massive undertaking. 
So our package, and I take the blame for this, you need a good acronym, this is not a good acronym, but I had to get the proposal written. Um, open Source Longitudinal Neighborhood Analysis Package, or OS LNAP, NAP probably isn't a good, good one for a, a thing you're trying to sell. Um, and it has a data analytics and visualization layer that Eli is gonna explain to you. So uh, let me tell you that there's uh, almost nothing more embarrassing for a geographer than to throw a map on the screen and for someone to tell you it's not where you think it is. Um, <laughs> so I'm off to a really great start uh, in this presentation, uh, and let's keep it rolling. Uh, it, it, it often helps me calm myself down if I move around a little bit, so if it distracts you, uh, shame on you. I'm up here. <laughs> Right, so uh, I'm going to talk about sort of our three core modules uh, that we're trying to put together, right? One of which uh, Serge mentioned already uh, is, is uh, this module that's focused on data issues broadly, right? So uh, as Serge mentioned, uh, most of our data come from the U.S. Census, right? The U.S. Census redraws boundaries uh, every 10 years, right? So if you're working at something like a, a state or a county level or a region, those things don't change. They're stable, right? If you want to understand neighborhoods or cities or something, you know, even smaller than that, a census block, those change all the time, okay? And if you want to do time series analysis, you need something consistent to understand whether or not it's changing. If its boundaries are changing and its time is changing, then we have no idea what's going on. Okay, and the problem is that uh, if you try and disaggregate census units, uh, you're incurring a lot of unknown error because you don't know the way that your, your variable is distributed across space, right? So here's an example. These are, are two sets of census tracts, right? So the, the dark, uh, the, the sort of the thicker line widths are 1990 and the thinner are 2000. You can see in this B inset here, uh, a single census tract in 1990, uh, 10 years later was split into eight. Right? And so if we were trying to understand uh, the change in each of these eight tracks, we have to find some way of modeling down uh, their original sort of form and try and understand you know, what, what that might relate to uh, in that smaller geography. Okay? So to give you an example of what this looks like, here are some actual census tracts right, in, in suburban Maryland uh, near where I did my PhD at, at, at UMD. Right? So let's say, for example, you are interested in this tract, right? and you've got some some interesting data on, say, poverty, right? And uh, in, in uh, 2020, a census comes along and slices it in half, right? So no sweat. We've got 50% uh, in, in sort of one piece of this. We've got 50% in another. Let's just allocate 50% of whatever our variable was to each of these halves, and, and we'll go for it. Okay, the problem is that if you look at the way that uh, this census tract is actually drawn, right, all of the population is, is in that one little corner, right? So, so urban development patterns are notoriously lumpy. And so if you were trying to naively uh, allocate based on space, uh, you'd be way off because you'd be assigning a ton of poverty to this forest, right? <laughs> and in some ways that might not be wrong, right? The, there's probably not a, a lot of purchasing power in that forest, right? But, uh, but these are common issues that, that people have to deal with all the time. So as Serge mentioned, there are a handful of products where folks have done this. Uh, geolytics, you have to pay for. Uh, the other two products on the right are open source, but their methods aren't, aren't open source, right? So you can download the products, you can use them, but you don't understand the decisions of that, uh, that the folks made when they built these products. You don't understand uh, what, what error you might be propagating through your analysis, right? So uh, in our data module, we want to allow you to ingest not only what, what other people have done, but you want to also be able to develop your own data products, right? So that might mean standardizing data sets to new boundaries, uh, using some auxiliary data so that you don't make these, uh, these really bad allocation mistakes that I just talked about. You might want to develop your own, uh, your own primitive units, right? Maybe you want to uh, allocate everything to census blocks. Maybe you want to use tracts. Maybe you want to use cities, right? That should be up to the analyst. Okay. The other, uh, the other big piece that I want to talk about is the, the analytics module, but I'm going to talk about it in, in sort of two, uh, two different parts, right? So the first is uh, identifying neighborhoods. Right, so, so what is a neighborhood? Right? So I happen to be on Twitter, unfortunately you can't see these. I happen to be on Twitter today, um, and uh, somebody tweeted this thing that says, you know, Chicago neighborhoods uh, are straight up fake. Uh, this is the only one I have a problem with because Lakeshore East is on the opposite side of the river and the other two named areas. So this other guy replied, so how, how many of you believe that Lakeshore and Lakeshore East is a real neighborhood? Right? The, the concept here is that, that, that places have identities, right? And, and, and they speak deeply to people. And, they, and it, it, that's how people navigate cities, that's how people understand sort of the, the spatial syntax of place, right? 
but that's still sort of an, an open question. Everyone can have their own interpretation on, on what a neighborhood is. Uh, but, but how do we put some empirics behind that, right? W what is a neighborhood if we actually look at the data? So it turns out um, this is uh, at least a 100-year-old question. Uh, if anyone is familiar with this, uh, with this graphic, this is uh, something that some Chicago, some, some sociologists at the University of Chicago put together in the 1920s. They were trying to understand what Chicago looked like, right? So uh, for those of you that are familiar with it, right, that, that big line is, uh, that's like Michigan, right? And then uh, Chicago sort of works in concentric zones moving outwards. And you notice what they did here is essentially, you know, multivariate clustering, right? They said, let's look at the city and try and understand neighborhoods as this segmentation of race and class and ethnic origin uh, because people seem to segregate into, into enclaves, right? And that sort of made sense for Chicago, right? Uh, of course, now we have the same kind of idea, but we do it a little bit differently, right? Now we let the algorithms handle this for us, right? So this is an example of uh, geodemographic typology uh, that tries to encapsulate some of those same Chicago school ideas, but using something like k-means or agglomerative ward or something like that, right? What you notice is quite different about this map versus this one Oops. Uh, is that in, in, uh, in the Chicago school concept, neighborhoods are, are contiguous, right? So, so they're sort of defining uh, areas that, that are inhabited by certain social groups, but those are, those are well-defined places, right? This looks like paint splatter, <laughs> right? That those, those yellow areas, right? contain the same kind of people, but it's not what you would call you know, a, 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 a you know, well-defined, well-contained neighborhood. That can be useful and that can be a nuisance, right? If you're trying to figure out how you market something, how you uh, want to get a political candidate elected and you know that uh, people are sensitive to these kinds of uh, advertising, then this can tell you where you might look that you might not have realized that, uh, that you might have thought before, where you know, your, your, your target uh, audience is going to live. Okay, but if, if you want to do uh, something that, that has actual uh, spatial implications, this, this doesn't help you very much, right? So uh, in OSL NAP, we are also working on a handful of uh, clustering algorithms that sort of, um, that strike a balance between attribute homogeneity and spatial contiguity, right? And there's lots of different ways that you can define spatial contiguity, right? So whether things share a vertex or an edge or so forth, right? Uh, and these uh, come up with uh, quite a different solution to what neighborhoods look like. Uh, what you can't see in, in, in this one is this is actually picking out the gentrification in southeast uh, DC, which is a, a pretty fascinating, uh, fascinating feature here. Um, but these, these give you a, a very different sense of what neighborhoods and regions might look like if you constrain them to be, uh, to be um, uh, contiguous, right? So this, this blue area might actually be quite similar to the red area, but they're physically disparate, right? So they are distinct places, even though the people that live there are kind of the same, right? And I think this is, is uh, much more similar to the way that we think about neighborhoods in our daily experience, right? And, you know, with our tools, you can, uh, you can look at this question in, in a variety of scales and a variety of places. Uh, we can't get into what these typologies actually look like, but if you're familiar with these cities, I want to talk to you. Um, so the other thing that we're trying to do is, is measure neighborhood change, right? So we've, once we've identified neighborhoods, what does it mean to understand what they're, what they're doing over time? So one way to think about this is kind of temporal geodemographics, right? So as Serge mentioned, geodemographics is essentially the, the practice of uh, applying cluster analysis to socioeconomic data and space, but then it ignores that space, right? Then you end up with that paint splatter map um, and, and you know, nothing is, is, is contiguous. So instead, we might think about how we do uh, neighborhood analysis over time. So in this case, we have taken all of our census tracts, we've lumped them into one data set because everything is now at a consistent geographic unit, and we've run the cluster analysis on the entire data set. What this means is that for every census tract, it's represented in the data set five different times and can be classified into different types in different time periods, right? Because each census, the socioeconomic attributes are going to change, so that allows you to be placed into different neighborhoods over time. This is pretty fascinating because we can see that some places are, are pretty stagnant over time, right? These are the Hollywood Hills. They stay blue, right? Rancho Palos Verdes down here, big, beautiful houses on the hill. They, they stay really nice, right? Concentrated poverty, meanwhile, in the, mid, in the middle of, uh, of L.A. is spreading, right? And we get a really good sense of what this actually looks like. Okay, so our tools help you do this, right? Once we, once we have sort of a string of neighborhood types, the question is how do we model it, right? So there are two different perspectives. One's dynamic, uh, that looks at spatial Markov chains, and another's a holistic perspective that bars some sequence analysis and genomics. All right, so I'll move quickly because I'm out of time. So really quickly, so you can imagine if you have this, uh, this matrix of neighborhoods. 
So for any given neighborhood, uh, you look at whether it's going to change the likelihood that it changes into a different neighborhood type over time. So in this simple example, it's pretty common for a neighborhood to stay its, its own class over time, right? We've got the, uh, this, this, the strong diagonal, right? But we might also ask what happens if you condition that transition based on who's around you, okay? So what these heat maps show you is how likely, if you are neighborhood type zero, how likely are you to be neighborhood type zero in the next time period? How likely are you to be neighborhood type zero in the next time period if all of your neighbors are type zero? What about if all of your neighbors are type one? What about if they're type two, right? So each of those has, if you condition on your neighbors, you're gonna end up with, with different likelihoods. And these, these heat maps already show you that that is in fact the case, right? So if you ignore spatial dependence, uh, your models are gonna be wrong, okay? Really quickly, sequence analysis, we're borrowing from genomics, right? So in this case, we're, not, we're looking not just at, uh, at a transition between two types, we're looking at the whole sequence of, of neighborhoods, right? So here are two, two neighborhoods represented by these sequence of types. You can imagine trying to come up with metrics, right? Again, this, these are like Hamming distances. So uh, in the places where they match, these strings get, uh, get a, a good sequence, and where they don't match, they get penalized for that. Then we can shift and allow them to align on uh, the, the best match, but that breaks sort of the, the temporal alignment, and the question is, does this matter? Are we still earn, understanding something about neighborhoods by understanding sort of their general trajectory, or do we have to understand the way that they changed in the same time periods, right? We're doing lots of viz. We want your help with this. Okay, so the next thing we want to do is uh, actually do a lot of this work, right? We want to, we want to consume this ourselves. So we want to do a bunch of research. Uh, Levi has, has built a, a really fascinating tool called uh, SendPy that, that will uh, programmatically download data from, from the census, and all these tools are built into our, uh, to our platform to allow you to do this. Uh, thanks to our funders. Uh, if you want to get in touch with us, we're on Twitter. Come check out our website. Come get in touch with us after the talk. Thanks a lot. Questions? There's a mic there, and I can also work to bring one around if that is helpful. Uh, are there any questions? Are there any questions for Serge? All right, uh, there we go. <laughs> um, yeah, interesting talk. I was just curious on the input data side. Obviously, census data is pretty limited, um, but are there, you know, what variables do you use to make these neighborhoods, and do you guys make decisions about kind of what's an important neighborhood variable, or do you do that algorithmically? Yeah, or, you know? uh, the answer is, is we don't want to make that decision for you, right? You, you might want to do uh, lots of, so, so maybe you are uh, an economic geographer, you're interested in uh, providing uh, workforce development services, right? Your, your geodemographic typology might be based on uh, uh, jobs in different industries so that you understand where there are sort of job centers that, that people might access, right? That's a different question than uh, where is sort of substandard housing and people living in, in concentrated poverty. Those, those are very different research angles and the, you can define the neighborhoods. It's, it's perfectly logical for neighborhoods to be defined on either of those depending on the research question at hand, right? So. I don't think we want to be in the business of telling people which variables to use because it's that, that's sort of analysis dependent, but uh, we want to be able to consume anything that they have in the census and then anything that you might want to bring to the table as well. Um, are there, uh, we have time for like one more quick question. Oh, this is not going to be quick. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, we don't have time for it. Does anyone have time for it? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, uh, I just want to say that I think I have the solution for your acronym. Uh, you just drop the L. You could be yes. O-SNAP. <laughs> SNAP. <laughs>